So uh, I begin every interview with the same question. Could you introduce yourself and say what it is that you are known for? Well, I was born in uh, Los Angeles, California, and born and raised there and uh, was able to go to Stanford, uh, so stayed in California. And from Stanford, I fell into the Stanford KO Exchange Program, KO University in Tokyo, and I came over on that in uh, summer of 65 and then again in 68. And after my KO stint, I applied and became a guide at Expo 70 in Osaka. I met the right guy at that Expo 70 uh, job, and it uh, led to me becoming the general manager of the Lodi Orions in the California League in 1972. That became the Lodi Lions in 73. And then I came to Japan in 74 to work in the front office of the uh, Taiho Club Lions. I was the first American, I believe, to be in the front office of a a Japanese professional baseball team. And then from 75 to 79, I worked for Desant, the big sportswear company in Osaka, and I did their international licensing. I did one a major license with the NCAA, but I also did NBA, Major League Baseball, ABA, World Team Track, I know no, World World Team Tennis, uh, ITA, International Track Association, Canadian Football League. I did all North, North American licenses for Desant. And also did their uh, supplying of official uniforms for teams in the United States. Did the uh, Baltimore Oils, the Pittsburgh Pirates. Also did the U.S. speed skating team and ski team, the Canadian speed speed skating team and ski team, uh, U.S. volleyball, Canadian volleyball. Did a bunch of fun things like that. And then I got into broadcasting. I started with baseball games for for, uh, Sun TV in Kobe, and that led to doing baseball commentary for Kansai Television in Kansai. And from there, it went on to more and more sports broadcasting. And I wrote some books, mainly on baseball. And uh, that led to a friend of mine who owns Suntory to ask me uh, about how to get into the baseball business. And we bought the Birmingham Barons. Uh, That was the uh, end of the 80s. And then from 90 to 94, we owned that team. And I was the president the first two years. Had the fortune of having uh, Bo Jackson play for me in the first season. And then a fairly well-known guy by the name of Michael Jordan came to play baseball for me in 1994. Which is obviously on the lips of many people in the United States right now with the last dance going on. Which I've been watching several times a day. (laughs) Really enjoying it. But anyhow, I came back to Japan then uh, after my stint in, uh, in Birmingham. I opened my third bar in Tokyo and then did my first uh, TV show uh, called Heroes Bar. And later on, that morphed into uh, Marty's Bar. And that was kind of like a Costas show with, you know, his. I think his show was called, Bob Costas' show was called, I think, Up Close and Personal. And my show was a kind of takeoff on that. And then I guess, and then then finally, I mean, it's all sports stuff, and I finally uh, became the, the GM of... The Rock Ten Eagles, and at the end of 2004, and so was the first foreign uh, general manager of a any major sports franchise in Japan. That was baseball, and then now, as of the year before last, 2018, I became the senior GM of of the professional basketball team here in 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 Sendai, the Sendai 89ers. Long long introduction. I've done a lot of things. I've been here a long time. Your name, for the record. Ah, excuse me. My name's Fina Marty Keenert. I'm sorry I didn't tell you that. Yeah, fine. That, that was something I didn't didn't mention in the beginning. Okay. So, what is your earliest memory of film or television? Whichever one comes first. I think you know I was uh, you know, as I've just told you, my life is pretty much wrapped around sports. So when I was a little kid, it was you know I was out in the street playing ball all the time. But I do remember that on Sunday nights we would always watch the Ed Sullivan Show. That was a big, big event in our household, watching Ed Sullivan. And I remember as a youngster, you know, getting to see Elvis Presley for the first time. And that was a big deal. And then I remember that and then the Beatles came from from England. And that was big. I remember those things like Presley and Beatles coming. We even had neighbors come over to our house. I think we had a little larger TV set than they did. So it was a really a, a big deal when, when those things happened. And then I went on to watch. And even after I got into college, and I, I still watch that show for the music mainly. I enjoyed besides sports music. I remember Stevie Wonder and the Beach Boys and James Brown and all those good things. So Ed Sullivan was a, a big thing in our family as a kid. I, that's one of the, the highlights of, of my TV memories from when I was a youngster. 
What kind of hobbies did you have growing up? It was all about sports. You know, I, I, I was playing football three months in the fall and then, then basketball three months in the winter and then spring in school and summer, you know, in the, in the summer leagues playing baseball. So it was football, basketball, and baseball 12 months out of the year. Do you remember when you first played baseball? Not professionally, but just the first time you ever played baseball? Yeah, I mean, pretty, I, yeah, pretty much. I think I was like six years old. I started in, you know, one of those little leagues and, and progressed from there. So from like six on, I was, baseball was the main game. When I went to Stanford, uh, you know, in, in high school, I played football, basketball, and baseball. But, but when I went to Stanford, it was a baseball only. My best sport was, was baseball. I actually had a, a, a offer from uh, the Angels out of high school. It was the year before the draft. I said the draft first year was 1965, and, and in 64, they had a tryout camp at Sockdale, and I was offered a huge signing bonus of $500 and a, and a monthly salary of $500 a month if I'd play single-A or rookie ball. And my dad said, I think your scholarship to Stanford is worth more. So, <laughs> But baseball was the game for me, and I had a, had a chance to play professionally, but probably best that I, I opted not to. And I was one of those marginal players that a role player I wasn't going to be a star. Could you talk about your formal education prior to your first exchange to Japan? My my schooling in L.A. was uh, I went to a parochial school, Lutheran a grade school for eight years, and then Lutheran high school in L.A. for four years. So it's 12 years of Lutheran schools. Had a real tough mom, a great mom. She pushed me really hard uh, to study. You know, so for me, in, in all the way through high school, it was either playing sports or studying. I was number one boy to graduate in my class at GPA wise and, and I think I'm number three overall. And I had a lot to do with the mom that was uh, really pushed me. Can you talk about the time when you saw that that advert about studying in Japan? <laughs> yeah, when I, when I went to Stanford, uh, I went with three things in mind. I was going to become a doctor. You know, I was going to get good edu- good education and become a doctor. Also, I wanted to play baseball. They had a great baseball program. In fact, the, the head coach, Dutch Faring, was a Lutheran. So he had recruit, recruited me heavily because I, I think in the last year of high school, I led the Lutheran high schools in, in the United States in hitting. So he was kind of high on me, and he was a great guy, so easy to want to play for him. And the other thing that attracted me about Stanford is they had this great overseas program. They had five campuses in Europe, their own campuses, and basically every undergraduate at Stanford can go overseas, unless you're in a program that's so restrictive, like engineering or something, where you, know, you can't duplicate the science facilities overseas. But anybody else can go overseas, and, and I wanted to. I had a wonder list. And my, I think it was my, about my fourth or fifth week at Stanford, and I walked in the men's bathroom at, at Rinconada Hall, the freshman dorm that I was in, and above the urinal was a sign that said, spend a summer in Japan. I said, well, that sounds intriguing. And it said, if you're interested, come to a meeting at Tresider Union Hall this weekend, and there'll be an explanation meeting about it for all those that are interested. And so I, I jokingly have written in a number of my books and, and, and other publications that I've done that, that my love affair with Japan began in a bathroom. How long did it take you to acquire the language? I think that has been um, ongoing. You know, I, I even today still think that I learned Japanese. When I do a new TV show or have to do a new speech, I'm still learning stuff. You know, my good buddy Dave Spector, you know, always has a, a book with him, even today with his fabulous Japanese and when he hears a word or, you know, sees a kanji that he doesn't understand, he writes it down and he learns that. It wasn't a, you know, overnight situation. One year and I spoke Japanese or two years and I spoke Japanese. I think I took beginning Japanese about three times, you know, so it's just a matter of constantly working at it. I would say that the, by the time, though, that, you know, I got to Expo 70, I was pretty good, fair. But then it's gotten progressively better, you know, if you have to use it in your work. Like when I went to Desant for five years, I mean, it was all in Japanese. And then in, uh, most of my jobs uh, along the way have all been using Japanese. Certainly being a general manager of a baseball team or, and then now a basketball team, it's, you know, it's, it's 90 plus percent Japanese. So when you use it, you, you gradually really learn it well. And I'm pretty good now. I certainly don't think I was really good back in the days when I came over as a student from Stanford to Kale. Now, was the first time you came over from Stanford, was that when you were cast uh, on NHK's English teaching program? No. Okay, when was that? that? Uh, The first time I went to Japan was uh, the summer uh, between my freshman and sophomore year, so that was the summer of 65. In 68, I I applied for a year's scholarship to go to Keio. There was one student that got to do that, 12 that came on the summer exchange. 
and I went on both of them. So I went once after my freshman year, and then in my senior year, I had a full year. And it was in that year, which was 68, that I actually uh, went to the Nichibe Kaiwa Gakuin, the Japan American Conversation Institute, to get a job for my girlfriend who wanted to come over and be with me in Japan. And then they wouldn't let me out the door because I looked the perfect gaijin uh, look that they wanted to have. I didn't have a PhD in linguistics, but I, I had the look of the foreigner that they wanted to have at their school, so they wouldn't let me out the door until I agreed to teach. And then w- where the NHK job came along was after I agreed to teach there uh, part-time, like in the evenings, I met a, a, a gentleman there that was working for NHK and had, was working on that show that I got on to. And he said, you'd be perfect for our show. You have the right look to be on our show, so we want you to be on our NHK show. So uh, it came via you know another teacher that was at the Japan American Conversation Institute who invited me to be on the show. Describe that show. Sure. Um I mean, it was just pretty straightforward, you know, um, English teaching show. Um, you know, we, we would have the phrase of the day or the phrases of the day that we would go over and then we would repeat it. Actually, some scenes would kind of, you know, have a, I don't know, a mock play. And we would use those words or the phrases that were being used in, in, in that particular day. I actually, it was kind of a blur now, so long ago, <laughs> 68. It was just a kind of a normal way to teach the language. Most of the language shows, like whether it be French or Spanish or English, I think they're pretty much done the same way. There was no really special thing about the show. It was pretty straightforward, just teaching, you know, simple English. But the interesting thing about that show for me was the power of NHK. Uh, two major things occurred based on that show. A Frenchman by the name of Pierre Gesso, he got the first... Academy Award for a documentary film. Uh, when was that? It was 1962. And his, his a documentary about uh, New Guinea called The Sky Above and the Mud Below won Academy, the very first documentary Academy Award. And this guy then, after winning this, he was kind of an unknown, but because he won Academy Award, then, then people wanted to give him money to do other things. And NBC gave him a lot of money in 68 to come to Japan and do a documentary. And the reason he wanted to do well, he actually did a film. The uh, reason he wanted to do it is he had fallen in love with a Japanese lady that he eventually married. Anyhow, he came to Japan, and he wanted to shoot a special, a movie for, for NBC, and it was called Bye Bye Butterfly. And it was then brought in the United States in 1969. I mean, a full-blown movie. And I played the lead, you know, male, and his... Do- you know, his bride to be in the future, Kosaka, what was her first name? Kyoko, Kyoko Kosaka. She was the, the, the female lead in that show. So I did that movie in 68, which was broadcast in, in the States in 69. And then also another interesting thing has happened that, that people at Fuji TV saw me on that show and thought I would be perfect to fit in a, a role they had with Atsumi Kiyoshi in his show, long running show. Uh, he had the movies are the famous ones. Otoko Watsurayo. Do you know the series? Watsurayo. Uh... Watsurayo. It's probably, I think it's, it's got the Guinness Book of Record for its longest series of movies made. I mean, over, I don't know, 30, 40 years, he made 30, 40, you know, 50 movies. Anyhow. Not Toro. Atsumi Kyoshi is, is, is as famous. Uh, yeah, they did call him Tora. Tora. Yeah. No, they did. I think it, That's I, what I, know I think that. his, yeah, his nickname is Tora. Yeah. The That's bomb right. with the suitcase and the hat. Yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yes. I know yeah. what you're talking about. Okay. In 69, Fuji TV did the only ever Otoko Atsurayo TV series. And I was asked to be on that, and I was in two segments. And the, the darndest thing is, is that no one has any copies of that video now. I asked my the, the director from Fuji TV that got me into the show, and we're still friends. His name is Yokota, Ansei Yokota. And uh, I asked him, you know, I'd like a copy of that, you know, in any form at all. He said, it doesn't exist. And I said, what do you mean it doesn't exist? And he said, in about 70, when things started going digital, they had so much film that they made a decision to throw a lot of their film uh, libraries away. Now, as you being a historian, probably this drives you crazy. But it probably has happened, I would imagine, in the United States, too. Maybe it has to go back further. But they just didn't have enough room for all their film in those days. And that particular series was one of the ones that was chucked out. And I subsequently met the son of Atsumi Kiyoshi, who was later working for Fuji TV, and I was doing a sports show or something, and I, I was told that his son was there. So I figured, well, the family has this archive someplace. And I went and talked to him. He said, they don't have it. They know it, it occurred, but they don't have it either. So that's one of the things in my history that I'd like to find. 
I actually should get some still photos and some. There's got to be that kind of stuff available. But the, the, that film of that show, Tokuba Tsurayo, that I did for Fuji, does not exist. I'm told. But anyhow, that was the that was the power of NHK though at that time. I mean, you you know everybody watches NHK. And how long did you do that show for? That one uh, with the Otoko Atsurayo? How long was that? Yeah, well, that was seventy. So just one series. It, no, it was it was just it was just sixty nine because in seventy I went and then was working at Expo seventy. So it was I was at the end of sixty nine, and I I think it was two segments that I was on. Okay. And do you remember what you who you played? I played uh, an um, American drifter kid that was in um, Japan, and uh, I remember Atsumi Kiyoshi, and I didn't have any money, and he was on a street corner selling soap, I think it was, and I came up, and I, I mimicked what he was saying for the sketches that I had done, and tried to sell them right next to him, and he got really upset with me that I was using his lines, and that I was you know, you know know impeding on his street corner, and since he couldn't tell me off uh he took me home to his place to have his uh, sister who could speak a little english tell me that i'm not supposed to be doing that and that's where it went i mean then I, then then they felt sorry and i said well i hadn't eaten in three days and whatever it was you know so they took me in so i became a, a very temporary part of the family for this the, the the two series and how did your career in the world of sports progress in the 70s because i know that that leads into your commentary prior to how much? Well, broadcasting began when I was actually with Descent in the late 70s. And I think there was an all-star game, uh, baseball game in the Osaka area. And I believe it was Kansai Television came to me and said that they were you know, doing the broadcast. And they knew that I had been a general manager at the minor league level and that I had played some baseball. You know, I was a pretty knowledgeable guy about the game. And especially, I think the, the the having been a general manager in the in the professional minor leagues in the states intrigued them too, and they had me on as a special guest for the All Star game. And afterwards, I found out that they liked it. Then, after that, in late seventies and into the early eighties, then both Sun TV, well, actually, Sun TV is the one that really gave me the best opportunity. They asked me to be on as a regular, first on their Hanshin Tigers broadcast, and then their Honky Braves broadcast. And here and there, I did broadcast for. For Kansai TV in Japanese, but then their boom began where they had the uh, uh, bilingual broadcasts, and then in the 80s, Kansai TV and then Fuji TV and their whole network asked me to do a lot of the Yomiuri Giants games, uh, English broadcasts of play-by-play, and I did that all through the 80s. So it began by chance, you know, one show in, in the late 70s, an All-Star game, and it led to you know expanding and, and doing other broadcasts. I know you were the first, you were one of, if not the first, gaijin to do Japanese commentary on baseball. Did you have a style that made you sort of different or made you stand out vocally or vocabulary-wise from the other commentators at that time? I think a lot of people found it, you know, a curiosity that here's a, a gaijin that's speaking Japanese and, and in a knowledgeable way about the game. I think maybe if there's one thing that set me aside is that, you know, uh, if if somebody did something that I thought was really bad and was stupid. You know, I might call it out where I think that most of the broadcasters in Japan, you know, they have a home set of broadcasters. You don't criticize your own your home team. You know, if somebody did something I thought was really ridiculous. You know, I might mention it, whereas the Japanese broadcaster, you know, might not say anything about it. I think that's perhaps the the main thing that would have set me apart. And did you have a different style when you were doing the English broadcast or was it just the same, just in a different I think it was the same, you know, uh, with the English broadcast, most of the times I would do the play by play and then, and I'd bring a, a, a guest commentator in. But occasionally I would let my buddy, uh, Wayne Gratzik, who was a longtime sports writer for Japan Times, I'd let him do the, I'd have him do the play by play and I'd do the commentary. You know, they're two different roles. But I, I think the way I presented it, I always tried to be fair, but I mean, fair and be tough, tough at times too. You know, I mean, if a, a guy was just, you know, horrible. And it was a horrible performance. How can you say he had a great day? You know, it's just impossible to do. So I, I was just straightforward. And had you appeared on any other shows prior to Seikai in that period? I know you'd done the English language. Did you do any other game or variety panel shows prior to that program? You know, I was mainly in a in the sportscaster role, sports commentator role. I, I do remember around that time I did, did one show. It was called the II Game. A uh, match game, yep. I, I game on, on Fuji TV. Um, I remember the set 
they had like two tiers where the panelists sat, you know, you know, and I was, I remember I was up behind a very beautiful actress. I thought that was a lot of fun that I was <laughs> right behind her doing the whole show. But I don't think, I only think I was on once or twice. You know, I, I didn't do, uh, you know, I was not really that kind of talent. You know, I was considered more of a sportscaster than a, than a, than a talent to be on those kind of shows. So how did Seikai Marugoto, how much come about? Well, at that time, I was working um, mainly on modeling jobs. You know, I mean, all I think all the guys that come to Japan, you, you know, go that route if they can. And I was working for Thoroughbred Promotions or, or Productions Promotions. It's Thoroughbred, anyhow. Uh, Kondo-san, I think, was the boss. Somebody told him that you know I might be good for modeling, and and he called me and said, "Would you like to model?" And I said, if, "You know, if it's going to help pay the bills, that would be great." So I started doing a series of commercials for Canon Camera. Yamaha motorcycles and a lot of, you know, one off shots here and there. And initially it was just modeling. And then one day he, and then Konda called me and I think most of the, most of the people that were on, uh, how much came through thoroughbred. I think the majority did. And anyhow, I, I, he said, we, I've got this, you know, quiz show that I'd like you to be on. And, and he said, have you seen it? And I think I had, I t- told him I had seen it. I had seen, seen, you know, and Kent Gilbert was on. He was on more than anybody else, and I had seen him in the performance. He said, "You know, it can't can't always be on. They want to rotate. They want to have some other guests." And, and I said, "Sure." So I mean, that's how I got on through through Mr. Kondo Thoroughbred Productions. Can you describe that show for someone who's never seen it? I think, as you know, and uh, it's it's very close to the, what the Price is Right in the in the states, where you have panelists. There's five panelists, and and they uh, are shown. A product or an item or a service or something from some place in the world. They would go off on these, you know, weird locations, go to some island in the Caribbean and ask you to say how much it would cost to buy that island or go to some place in, in Europe where they have a particular service, you know, to train uh, dogs that, you know, act as your ears, not just your eyes. Uh, I don't know what you call those dogs. I don't, with, with seeing, it's seeing eye dog, but I don't know what you call about the dog that, you know, Alerts its master when is you know a bell or a, a sound you know the telephone that kind of thing. Service dogs, but, is, yeah. yeah, some kind of service dog. But they're, in particular, they're dogs that that will help people that can't hear, and act as their ears. And you know how much would it cost for a dog like that? So that was the show. I mean, they, there was some kind of thing from uh, very interesting stuff. I always thought found it fascinating all the amazing stuff they came up with around the world. And then they asked the five panelists to to pick the. Uh, the, the price of that item and we'd all put it on on boards and you know put it up and then if you hit it right on you they had a, what they call as i think i'm sure you know as a hole in one hole in one yeah and then uh, if you got close we got a near pin then you know there were prizes for that and the, the hole in one got you a trip around the world did you ever get a hole in one i don't think so i was bad i i kent, kent was really i thought i was a smart guy but you know i I really blew it on most of those things. I, I don't think I was close very often. I think I got a couple of near pins, but I'm quite sure that I, 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 I know I didn't. I would I would remember if I got a hole in one. I didn't get a hole. Was there a prize for a near pin? There were, there were some kind of prizes, very nominal things, you know. I mean, some goods and you know, minor, minor stuff. If you had won the trip around the world, would you have taken it or would you have, would you have sold it like everyone else did? Cash in. I don't know. It would, it, you know, I ha, I have a wanderlust. I enjoy traveling. I like to see new places. So uh, had I, my schedule permitting, there's a good chance I think I might have gone. But you know, it, if I was really busy, then I would have had to cash in. I, I really couldn't say. It would have to have been when I got it, when I was ordered, that I would have gone. Now, did they give you any sort of special instructions or it's sort of what to wear on that program? Did they make you play up the baseball aspect of your persona, or do you remember what you wore on the show? I think I was just told you can dress as casually as you want. You know, I, I, I don't remember them. They didn't give me many, you know, specific directions at all. So it was pretty up, to, as, as I recall, it was pretty much up to me to what I wanted to wear. And I would just you know, normally wear, you know, casual stuff. Did you have any sort of repartee with any of the other Japanese celebrities that were on the show with you at the time that you remember? I, I developed a really close relationship with Kilsen, Ohashi Kilsen, because I had been on his 11 p.m. show a couple of times, and I remember very specifically the first one I was on. I was on, on with Dave Spector, 
and I, I love Dave. He's just a really interesting character. And but he says things sometimes that the Japanese don't understand. It goes right over their heads, and it might even go over my head sometimes because he he's got these weird things that he remembers and he throws out in his shows. And I remember that first 11 p.m. show. He said some, they were talking about someone, and he said, "Yeah, that guy's uh, all he does now is is make license plates from early in the morning to late at night." And that was a reference that I didn't even realize, and certainly none of the Japanese did, to the fact that most license plates in America are made in prisons. <laughs> so he was telling people that, you know, this guy's in, locked up someplace, and all he can do is make license plates. And I I didn't even understand it then. I, was, I said, well, what was that about afterwards? So, But anyhow, I was on that, and I know that uh, Kilsen liked Dave and liked me, and then so that, I'm sure that had some of the influence to do when, when I mean, Kilsen really controlled that show. So I'm sure when... Um, when he found that I was on the roster of, of people that worked at Thoroughbred, I, it may very well, well, well have been Kilsen that earmarked me to be on the show. And the thing that may, I really have a lot of respect for that guy. I mean, he was amazing. I and mean, he was a, a, a expert on jazz, on horse racing. He was a scratch golfer. And one of the things that he liked, he liked American football a lot, especially college football. So we would get together every once in a while, either at my place or his place, to watch college football together. So he and I were close. I remember when I went to uh, Canada one time, I went to Banff uh, on an assignment for somebody and some job. So I knew that he had that his OK, you know, gift shop in, in Banff. So I went there and had a picture taken with the general manager. And when I came back, I sent it to him and he, he called me right away and said, oh, you went to my, my gift shop in you know Canada. And I said, yeah, I wanted to see it. So anyway, we were I, I really liked I felt that I was close to Kilsen. And the other guy that I got pretty close to was B. Takeshi. Beat, if you look back in, at things in the past, you know, he's almost always had his own amateur baseball team. He grew up really liking baseball. And he went to a lot, you know, he had a lot of uh, professional baseball friends here. One of them was the guy that was in his Takeshi Joe, you know, uh, Animal Leslie. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and Animal Leslie and I were really good buddies because I broadcast all of Animal's games. I was broadcasting for either Sun TV or Kansai TV when Animal was playing for the Hunky Braves. And I, I remember that at, at Animal's wedding, Beat Takeshi and I sat next to each other at the wedding. So later on, when he had his show, you know, Koko Ahendayo and Nihonjin, Beat, I think, earmarked me again to be, you know, the main expert commentator on the show. And that was because of my relationship with Beat. So, yeah, I, those two guys especially I, I built a bond with. What do you think separated you from the other foreigners who were on Seikai? Yeah, I mean... Kent had his good looks and his, his lawyer title and, you know, Chuck Wilson was Mr. Macho. What was it? Daniel Carl had his Yamagata Ben. They all had some kind of hook. I think I was probably just, you know, another one of those real gaijin looking guys, you know, California guy and blonde hair and, and light colored eyes and so forth. And in most of my other work, it's been, you know, my expertise on sports, but they, that was not part of the requirement for that job. So I think it probably just had to, you know, Japanese ability and looks. Uh, I don't know that there was anything else that really set me apart. Um, I didn't have a lawyer title. I, you know, I wasn't a champion bodybuilder, you know, that kind of stuff. I didn't speak any strange dialect of Japanese. So, uh, you know, Dave, you know, Dave Spector was not on that show. Correct. But had he been, he would be the funny man, you know. Uh, so I think all the guys that are pretty successful here usually have a hook of some kind. I don't know. My hook has always been sports, but. That wasn't. That didn't matter in that show. No, maybe it was just that you know, I know Kilsen knew me and liked me, and uh, that I'm sure that didn't that didn't hurt at all. Were you against playing up a persona of being the sports guy, sort of thing? You know, having that be your title of being the thing that you were known for when you appeared on television, or were you just accepting of the fact that people would know you as oh, that's the baseball guy? Yeah, I mean. The, the sports guy, really, because initially it started with baseball, but, you know, uh, later I bought in uh, in the 80s, I bought uh, all the programming, international programming for Sun TV in uh, Kobe, and uh, I bought NBA broadcasts, NCAA football broadcasts, top-ranked bo boxing broadcasts, ABC's Wide World of Sports. I bought all those things for these guys, and then... I remember in, in a, they had boxing a boxing expert that they could get on to cut new commentary, and they had you know some some guys for some of the sports that we got. But I was asked to do the commentary for all the NBA games, for all the wide world of sports shows, and for most of the NCAA football shows. 
So, and then later on, I mean, I did NFL broadcasts for, for uh, TBS. I, I did a wide range of sports. So I was always kind of known as the sports guy. But, and I didn't mind people playing that. I like sports. I mean, it's been my life. So uh, I didn't mind, you know, people playing that up. And in fact, in 1985, I mean, I had, uh, a year's contract to be this, the main sportscaster for TV Tokyo's Sports Today live TV show. I don't know if, what was that film called? Broadcast News or something in the States a long time ago where I remember that they... 87. Yeah, and, and the guy, remember in his, when he f- first started broadcasting, the initial guy they had on, he had his suit was soaked through with sweat, uh, his armpits. That is exactly what I felt like when I was had to do that show live in sports. Mm-hmm. And... I had a year's contract, but I only made it half the year. They mercifully let me off, off the hook after six months. But again, I, you know, I wouldn't have got that show if I wasn't known to be a sports guy. But uh, you know, how much didn't play that up at all? What other shows did you do in the '80s and '90s prior to Sports Bar? Were you on any sort of news programs? Were you seen as an expert on sports commentary? What kind of? Well. I mean, it's just, it was a long stream of, of doing all those different things, you know, I mean, for a long period. I mean, long period of time, I, I did the NBA broadcast. Uh, Kansai TV asked me to do the uh, commentary for their uh, Osaka Ladies Marathon, and I did it in over 10 years, every year. The, I did the English commentary. And the interesting thing, I said, who, I, you know, I, I said to them when they first asked me to do the show, I said, well, why do you want English commentary for the Osaka Ladies Marathon? I mean, I don't think it's something really exciting that, you know, English speaking people in Japan are going to listen to. And they said, it's to sell runners from other parts of the world to come to the next race. So their main reason to have that entire broadcast with me and then a guest, you know, a very famous person in the you know, running world be with me on that show for the entire marathon was to have a tape to be able to take out to the best runners in the world and show them what their race from the previous year was like. And, you know, it was a tool to get, uh, to get people to come. And but anyhow, I had you know, I, I had gigs like that here and there. I mean, strange things. Well, one of the other strange things you might find amusing is that I did the commentary for NHK in Japanese of the Rose Parade every year. I did you know literally the color commentary. And the reason that that I did that was is that growing up in L.A., initially my sister got involved in helping decorate the Lutheran Hour float that they would have in the parade every year. And then our whole family started doing it, and our, our church started doing it. And my sister went into that business. She worked for one of the big companies that makes those floats for the Rose Parade every year. And I helped a lot when I was in grade school and even into high school of decorating those floats. And I knew a lot about how they were put together and the elaborate process that was involved. My, my sister was buying played loans of, of flowers from the entire world all the floats that they were making for that parade and i really knew how how the floats are made and how the parade is run and so forth so nhk found out i don't know how they found that out but they asked me to do their first time they when they went to high vision tv they wanted to you know it was such a brilliant you know production they wanted to do the rose parade in in high vision well first one went well and then for the next decade or so i was doing every one of those broadcasts for the rose parade here in japan and do you know what year that was that you started? It was early 80s and into the early 90s. I remember that I went to L.A. the, the, the 10th year, we, for the 10th anniversary, we actually went to L.A. and did it live from Los Angeles. The first nine years were all, you know, we saw the the tape in the, in the studio in NHK in Tokyo and, and did the commentary there. But in the 10th year, we went and I went at least 10, if it was not 11 or 12 years. But I think... I, at least until 1992, 93, probably. When you were doing the commentary, you said you watched a tape. Was that the first time you saw it? Was what you said corresponding to what you were saying for the, seeing for the first time? No, or? Absolutely not. <clears throat> no, no, no. Oh, they, so. they, they, would, they, would, they would give it to me. They, they, when the tape came over, they would give it to me so I could go through and, again, pick out words and things that I needed to know where I didn't know the Japanese so I could be ready to make a good commentary when we got in the studio. So I got to see it before. That happened in a number of like the sports I did too. NBA was a terrific gig to have because I actually bought. I went and saw David Stern and, and you know when his first year as the NBA commissioner and and bought the rights for the the film to come to Japan. But there was you know they didn't have a little you know UHF station in Kobe didn't have the money to do a satellite broadcast. So none of it was live. So the NBA stuff that came over is all film and it would be sent over and then I get to see it. 
before I did the broadcast in the studio. And oh boy, I, did I look like a real NBA expert because I knew that, you know, you know in this game, a particular guy is going to have eight assists. And I could talk about with his first assist in the first quarter, what, how, you know, adept this guy was at stealing the ball. And, you know, I could make my whole storyline up in advance. And it was easy to do. And everybody loved my broadcasting. It was so right on. But I was really cheating. I knew what was going to happen before it happened. People recognize you on the street when you walked by. Did any of the sort of fame in the 80s affect you in any way? Did you reach that level of fame? Were you trying to reach that level of fame? I did. You know, I mean, I wasn't necessarily trying, trying to do it. It just happens. You know, I mean, if you're on TV that much. Although one thing I must say is that a lot of my broadcasts was I was on TV, but it was the voice. Mm-hmm. I was a commentator. You know, you don't see a broadcaster for a baseball game or a basketball game for the entire game. You usually see them in the beginning for the setup piece and then at the end of the game for the wrap up. You know, so my face was not as well known with those broadcasting days for sports as it later became when I did things like uh, Sakura, you know, the morning the morning drama or something. It's a big show that everybody sees. You know, I just did a, an NHK show uh, a couple of weeks ago about the derivation of words. They, they have uh, air here where they the way of cheering on uh, another sports team. And they said it, they said to me that that comes from the word yell in English. And they had a number of these things that Japanese use when they're cheering and so forth. And then they brought the English de- definition that they knew about it. In some cases, I didn't even know that the word had derived from that. But they wanted me to tell them what the real meaning was. And if I had known that it, you know, this is where it came from and so forth. Anyhow, it's amazing the power of NHK. It's like the, when I mentioned to you earlier, after I did that English show, then it led to a couple of big things right away in 1969. So when I did Sakura, the Asa drama, I mean, it, it was incredible. I'd go in, into um, grocery stores and being in the vegetable department, and some lady would come up to me and say, oh, Robbie's father. <laughs> you know? and so, you know, a lot of the shows that I've done, I've done, a, I'm sure I've done more than a thousand sports broadcasts. You know, I've never counted them up, but I've done it for so long. In some cases, I was doing 50, 60, 70 a year, at least, and maybe a hundred and some years. So I've done an awful lot, maybe thousands even. But in 90% plus of those shows, my face was, you know, not being seen very much, but the voice was. But people that followed the sport closely, they knew me because I would be in magazines then about that sport and so forth. So if you were an ardent NBA fan in the 80s, you knew Marty Keener. If you were an ardent NFL fan when I was doing the the NFL broadcast, NTV. I might have said TBS earlier, it was NTV. When I did those broadcasts, if you were an NFL fan, you know, you knew who Marty Keener was. But it had to be uh, making an association maybe through articles and other things. We might have seen my face in the article or actually watched the show very carefully and didn't miss the beginning and the end. With fame, were you happy with the fame or were you reluctant towards it? It, it didn't bother me. You know, I mean, it's, it was amusing at times. When I became the general manager of uh, the Rockton Eagles, they had a, the press conference uh, in October of 2004 there were like 300 cameras in the room you know the press conference was huge that there's a foreigner is going to become the general manager of a professional team and then when i came to uh, sendai everybody knew who i was i remember i was walking down the street one time in sendai and some guy stopped his car in the middle of traffic uh, and jumped out of his car with you know a signboard for one of me uh, autograph it i said give me that card you got to get back in that car you can't stop there but he did so I found that amusing. It didn't bother me. But I found the fame, it helped a lot. You know, easier to get tables at restaurants. Remember one time I pulled up the parking lot and there was a full sign in front. And the guy looked and saw that it was me and then he pulled the full sign away. <laughs> and he had me park where the full sign was and put the full sign behind my car. And so the next guy that came out then, he took and put my car in, you know, the parking space for me. So some of those things were nice, actually. But it didn't really bother me much. You brought up earlier Koko Gahen Dayo Nihonjin, which for those looking for a translation listening to this, uh, this doesn't make sense, Japanese people. Um, you brought up that Takeshi helped you get on that show. Could you describe your role on that show? Well, it's a real honor what he did for me. I mean, I was on sitting next to him as the expert, the authority. You know, I wasn't one of the 100 sitting in the stands, these, these gaijin who thought they might know something about sports here, but really didn't. And all these strange opinions. But it was not only there with, with their strange opinions. They always have people from the industry, the sport, 
sitting on uh, Takashi's right side. I was on his left side, and there was stands in front of us. But there, there was this one, you know, they always have a panel of so-called Japanese experts. It was about baseball, what it usually was about. They'd have people like, I remember very specifically, Tabuchi was in, Hoshino was in. I remember Hoshino was one of the most respected broadcasters in baseball, and, and I got into an argument with him on, you know, on the show and told him he was wrong. Do you remember what that was in regards to? Yeah, very much so. Um, I said that it was horrible the way, and he was one of the villains in this, horrible how umpires were treated on the field in Japan. And I, I, a friend of mine, Mike DeMuro, had this been an umpire in japan and had left after he was mistreated on the field um i think the american league sent him over as a trial and it didn't work out because he got you know pushed around and beaten up on the field and hoshino was part of that i said that you know when when a, a coach or an umpire or a player touches an umpire he should be thrown out of the game and the, and the penalty should be much more severe than they are right now and it's just it's a travesty and something and then he brought up the fact at that time that Robbie Alomar, who was, I knew him very well, was a really nice guy. When he spit on Hirschbeck, it was just so out of character. Later on, I think um, Alomar said that the Hirschbeck had used some racial slur or said something bad about his family, and he lost it, and he spit on him. Hoshino, brother, he says, well, you know, you guys spit on your umpires. And I said, I said, Hoshino, son, that's ridiculous. I said, you're talking about something that happened once in a hundred plus years. And what, what happens in Japan when umpires are kicked and berated and beaten it happens every week. And I said, you, you're, you're comparing Apple to the same thing. And, uh, oh, it was 1996 with Alamar and Prishka. Anyhow, I would get into this guys. You know, I thought something was absolutely wrong the way Japanese baseball was being played. I'd been, I'd written books on it. You know, you know one of my books was called, uh, why, why are the, you know, star Japanese players defecting to the major leagues? And then I, I broke down the game and what the problems in the game were. And part of it was umpiring. Part of it was broadcasting. Part of it was, you know, the management of the teams. There's all kinds of factors. But, you know, I knew the stuff pretty well. And so I think the, my role in that was to be the the authority. And that was nice. You know, that, that beat gave me the opportunity. He respected me enough to let me play that role or have that role. How long were you in that role? I know that you weren't, the, I know that you weren't in every episode, but... I remember at least three, at least three, four times, maybe even five. I don't know. This is the thing. I mean, this was not my main business. It was kind of a side business to do these things. So I don't remember each and every one of them. But I was on, a, you know, a number of times. Were you ever asked to do anything on Japanese television that you refused to do or that you felt was inappropriate or derogatory in any way, shape or form to either the people of Japan or the foreigners or yourself? Well, to myself, I, I refused to do a pachinko show. They wanted the, they had the, they had new, you know, talent or people go out every week and play pachinko at some kind of pachinko parlor. And I even, I don't even know how they did the show. All I knew is that part of what I was going to be asked to do was to go into this pachinko parlor and play pachinko. And I didn't even know what other stupid stuff they wanted me to do, but that was a no from the get go. I wasn't, you know, I'm a sports broadcaster and I'm not going to go play pachinko and, you know, be that kind of, light-hearted, ridiculous show. <laughs> so I said no. Do you consider yourself a serious person in terms of your public persona, I should say? Actually, I think I, you know, I, I enjoy humor a lot. I, you know, Dave, I think one of the reasons Dave Spector and I get along so well is that we hit each other with jokes all the time. And even on the air, I will throw in jokes here and, and make people laugh. You know, I, I do quite a few speeches and I, I always know that I make the entire audience laugh. You know, I, I've done really well. And of course, you want to get them to almost cry at times, too. But uh, I probably try to get more laughter into my speeches than anything else. So in broadcasting, I do it, too. So, I mean, just serious from the standpoint of, of being a good broadcaster. Is Bob Costas a good broadcaster? He's good. Does he not have any humor in his broadcast? Of course he has humor. You know, I, I saw how Bob Costas interviewed Ichiro after his you know first great season in 2001. And there are a number of places through that wonderful interview show that I, you know, tried to do the same thing with. Where he got each year to burst out in laughter. That's good. That's good broadcasting. So I'm serious. I mean, it's a serious job. Bob Costas is considered a serious, you know, real sportscaster. But is there no humor involved in, in his, you know, interviewing methods? Of course he uses, you know, humor. And I do too. So I want to talk about the, the drama Sakura, the NHK huh. drama. Going back to your NHK roots, how did you end up getting cast on that program? At that time, I was registered with Spectre Communications. I was represented by Dave. 
And Dave's office, I don't know his wife or one of the ladies in the office called me one day and said that NHK wanted me to be on this drama that they had called Sakura. And I said, yeah, I'm not really an, an actor. I'm a sports broadcaster. And the, Dave's wife or, or the lady who was talking to me said, well, Konishiki's going to be on the show. And Ramos, the soccer star, is going to be on the show. So here's a sumo guy that I know quite well and a soccer guy that I know fairly well, too. And there's, they're sports guys. They're not really actors. Mm-hmm. So I said, well, if they're going to be on it, I guess I can, too. So it didn't take me too long to say yes. If, if it hadn't been those guys on the show, I don't know if I would have said yes or not. But that's why I said yes. And uh, actually, it was a lot of fun. It was very difficult, though, actually, because they asked me to use a, a Kansai, which is a Osaka area dialect. I, when I learned Japanese, I always tried to do the standard Hyojin Go, the standard Japanese. So using that kind of dialect, it was, it was hard for me to learn. It was, the lines were much more difficult than it had it been standard Japanese. And describe, what was the name of the character you played? I was Robert Hoffman. I was the uh, father to the lead guy in the show who was Sakura's uh, fiance. And that was Thane Camus. Thane and I, Thane, Thane and I are really good close friends still. He always calls me a dad. <laughs> so I, I was his dad in the show, and, and I'm still his dad. He always calls me dad. And do you know? Do you remember how long that ran for? I was on for a two week period. In wrapping up, there's a couple of questions I want to ask everybody. As a gaijin or as a foreigner, I should say, in Japan, how do you feel about the stereotypes that some Japanese have towards foreigners in the country? And I know it's changed since you first got there, but were you reticent? Did you? have any sort of reluctancy toward that in any regards? And do you think it's changed for the better in the you know many years you've been living in Japan? You know, I'm not sure what the stereotype the Japanese hold. I know that I hear a, a lot of foreigners that here that talk ill of Inspector or Ken Gilbert or what is Pat Kuhn, Patrick uh, Harlan. I think there's more jealousy on the on the on the foreigners here that they're not on there. They're not, they're not able to do that. And you know, my Japanese is as good as his. Why am I not on that show? And I'm as good looking as he is. And why am I not on? You know, all of us that are that are, that have made it on the TV. You know, everybody you talk to is going to tell you that there was a lot to to do with luck, being in the right place at the right time to get that particular job. Just like my one stint on NHK in in '69. <laughs> teaching English led to two major roles. So there's a lot of luck involved too, but uh, I think that oftentimes I've heard the foreigners that are on here by other foreigners in Japan put down. And if ever I hear someone say that about Dave Spector, I said, you guys don't know Dave. You don't know how hard he works. And it's hard to work and be that funny. Mm-hmm. And it certainly is hard to work and be on TV for 30 years or longer. You know, And he's a real pro. And he, he works hard at his profession. And I think a, a lot of foreigners don't that come here, you know, for a short period of time don't realize that, don't understand it, and if anything, they're just jealous. I think probably the Japanese perception is more of well, isn't isn't that a curiosity? Here's this this gaijin guy that speaks such good Japanese and knows so much about Japan. I know I'm a curiosity in my speeches because I'm a gaijin guy, totally looking foreign, and yet I know more about Japanese sport than they do. I've ever thought of. And so I think there's a amount of respect that from the Japanese side for people like Dave and and for, you know, Kent and myself. I think they give us our, you know, we're, we're a curiosity to them, but I, I think in a good way, in a way that they, they uh, find it amusing to have someone like us talk about it. And there's a thing called gaiatsu here, which is, you know, outside pressure. Oftentimes they say that, you know, things won't change in Japan unless there's a lot of pressure from the outside, whether it be from governments or people. And I think... People like myself and, and the guys that, you know, we've talked about today here, you know, uh, certainly Kent and Dave and probably even Puck Goon, you know, they, it's an outside pressure. Give people a different perspective. I don't think you can really understand your own, own country unless you look at it from outside. And I think a lot of Japanese are just looking at their country from the inside and think everything is just normal and that's the way it is. Well, maybe there's a different way to look at things. And I think we pres- provide a different perspective on that. And I think the intelligent people here respect that and find it interesting. Conversely, what do you think about this? I don't know how much American or Canadian media that you consume. How do you feel about the stereotype that most non-Japanese associate with Japan in terms of their television variety shows and in terms of the culture in general? 
Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in Japan for so long, it's hard for me to say what stereotypes the, the people in the United States hold about Japanese television. I just know what I think, that it's, it's very superficial. You know, it's childish in many respects. These things are like, uh, they have all these what so-called idols mm-hmm. on, on TV. You know, an idol to me is Mother Teresa, Nelson Mandela, you know, Martin Luther King. You have to earn that title. But here in Japan, you know, it's, it's a different use of the, the English language. Mm-hmm. And so the way they treat women on Japanese TV, I mean, they're just flowers. They're, they, you have a fresh set of flowers this week and you throw them away next week and bring in another set of flowers. I find the Japanese TV overall just very, very superficial. And I imagine if I was watching it from the States instead of watching it from here, I'd think, think the same thing. Of course, you don't watch a lot of Japanese TV, usually, I think, unless you're in that culture. My favorite shows uh, in the states are, are 60 Minutes and and wide. You know, well, they used to be Wide World of Sports, but now Real Sports with Brian Gumble. And look at those shows. Look at the in-depth work that they do on those shows to produce a show. You know, one show of you know either one of those uh, one 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 segment on any one of those shows is probably the budget for a Japanese variety show for a year. They're underfunded and it shows. You got the same cheap talent on every show you see the same people on three or four or five shows in a day they run from one to the other and they make 50,000 yen each show $500 if they make that and it shows in the product I just find them very very superficial every once in a while you might have a hit come along something really you know good I think you know, B. Takeshi is really creative and I think some of his shows have, have really uh, done well but you know he gets like 100,000 per show you know, of course, he's producing in many cases too. But um, anyhow, I, I just find Japanese TV very superficial, and I guess if I was in the states and watching it from there, that's what I would think too. How has the world of sports and sports broadcasting in Japan changed since you first arrived in the country, or if it's changed at all? Well, I think sports itself has changed. You know, the, the players are better. You know, the kids have gotten bigger. When I first came to Japan, I thought everybody was, you know, nobody was over five feet five, and <laughs> you know, you know <laughs> they're all skinny and five foot five. Now I walk around and I see these players that are six foot five and you know real men and so forth. I think the players gotten bigger and better. They show that now by the the, the players that are playing overseas. You know, a lot of uh, soccer players are very good and playing in Europe and, and a lot of baseball players now. And the players have definitely gotten better. Unfortunately, I, I'm involved in the business end of it. Uh, sports business, you know, in in Japan is is light years behind. The funny thing is the Japanese society is looked at as a, a, a pull-together society. You know, they're a group-oriented society. They're supposed to pull together and everything. And Americans, they're supposed to be individualists and, you know, never cooperate with each other and do everything on their on, on their own. But you look at the NFL and all 32 teams make tons of money. You look at the NBA and uh, Major League Baseball and, like, out of 30 teams each year, 27, 28 make money. Even in the National Hockey League of the 31 teams now, about 2022 20, every year make money. It's like 90% of the North American, you know, professional sports teams make money. It's, sports is a business and it's gotten better and better and better each year. And, uh, in Japan, the ma- vast majority of the teams lose money. They don't cooperate with each other. They don't do, they don't sell broadcasting rights together. They don't do licensing together. They don't do anything together pretty much. They're all individual fiefdoms. So sports business has not changed here. The teams are still struggling financially. And the sports broadcasting certainly has not changed. It's just as superficial now as it was when I came years ago, I, I hate to say. You know, I just mentioned those shows that I liked in the States. You don't find the broadcasters here uh, like you do in the States. There are no Vin Scullys. There are no Harry Careys. The broadcasters here, like in baseball, and I used to find it ridiculous and I, I've, I knew some guys in baseball that were really good broadcasters, like play-by-play guys. They'd have their Tuesday team, their Wednesday team, and their Thursday team in the broadcast booth. They wouldn't have a star broadcaster and use him every day. Can you imagine Vin Scully told that he can only do one of every three games or one of every seven games? They have this thing that it's being fair to rotate the people that are announcers. And then they bring in different commentators. They don't have a fixed team. And consequently, you don't have people that can develop a story over a full season. And the, the Bob Costas interview with Ichiro in 2001 is really interesting. And in that interview, Bob Costas says to Ichiro, one of the times when Ichiro laughs, but it leads into a very serious topic. Bob Costas just said, says to Ichiro, oh, 
I just thought of the biggest difference between Japanese baseball and American baseball. And then Bob Costa says to Ichiro, in America, Harry Carey is a very good thing. In Japan, Harry Carey is not such a good thing. Well, you know, it's, it, you know, the word for harakiri, to mm-hmm. cut, you know, su- ritual suicide. Ichiro's manager happened to be a good friend of mine. Bob Turner was sitting behind him and told him, harakiri. And oh, the Ichiro goes, oh, harakiri. And he goes and he laughs. It's kind of a stupid thing. But then Ichiro says, and this is where the interesting part of that interview is, Ichiro says, we don't have any famous announcers like Harry Carey in Japan. It's just not the way things are done. Which is a sad commentary because there's some really good guys here, but they don't want to let a guy become a broadcaster, become a star. They, he's a salaried employee. So he's going to work so many hours a week doing his job. And then when he gets to 50 or 55, it doesn't matter of his ratings. I've written this in my books about the broadcasting too. I mean, Fuji TV had a fabulous an- announcer. And uh, when he hit 55, they kicked him out the door. And then their ratings of the pro Yaku news, the pro baseball news went down the drain. Anyhow, the broadcasting is not any, any better. The broadcasting for sports broadcasts here, they always have, like if they have a, a volleyball tournament or a big soccer tournament or some kind of major tournament or game, they'll, they'll bring on uh, idols, you know, a hit group of kids to make a song for the show. Mm-hmm. And then they'll bring some airhead women into the broadcast to be the flowers. And they don't know shit. I mean, they don't know anything about the sport. But they're brought in again and again and again and again. It drives me nuts when I see that. I was on an NHK show once and they brought in this girl and, <laughs> and she was young and she was, you know, one of those talent all. And I asked the director, you know, later, well, why is she on the show? And he said, she has big boobs. <laughs> I, was, I said, give me a break. And that's why I say, I, you know, I take it more seriously. I, that's an insulting to me that he even be sitting there in the same table with with a woman that doesn't know anything about the game and is, is there for that reason? How stupid. You know, I, I was just looking this morning at, at you know, my, my favorite sports pass. I love Wide World of Sports. You look at the, you know, the sports cast is in there. There's no Judy Rankin in 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 Japanese sports world. Judy Rankin was not only a great golfer, she's one of the great, greatest golf announcers ever. And she's, you know, she's in her 60s or whatever, 70s now and still broadcasting. doesn't matter how wrinkled her face is. She's got a brain that's, I mean, it's, it's a steel trap about golf. So she's, you know, she's on. You don't, and you don't have a, what is it, a Charlize Canty. She does the Churchill Downs, you know, Kentucky Derby every year. She's one of the best racehorse commentators in the country. And she's a woman and she's been on forever. She's not a flower. She's not a, you know, window dressing. And then Robin Roberts. She's really good on TV now, but she started as a sportscaster. She was a great basketball player, but she went in and became a good broadcaster. I respect these people. And and and, and on, on Real Sports right now, Mary Carrillo, Soledad O'Brien, Andrea Kremer, they're not on there because they're pretty. They might be attractive ladies. They're not on there for that reason. They're on because they know sport and they're really good commentators. So that hasn't changed in Japan. And I don't know if we'll ever see a good Japanese woman broadcaster. You brought up baseball teams not being able to cooperate. You know, what makes a baseball fan in Japan different from an American baseball fan, for those who may not be familiar with that? I think that in Japan, you know, it's, it's kind of this kind of, a, I mentioned earlier in a way that I find Japanese to be childish. Mm-hmm. There's kind of a childish loyalty to teams here, you know, a blind loyalty almost. I oftentimes my speeches say when you, when I, when I go to the Hanshin Tigers games to broadcast, I can't hear myself think it's so noisy. And that noise, I, I say, starts from before the first ball is thrown and until after the last out. It's the same level of noise. And I said that level of noise never changes whether they're winning 10-0 or losing 10-0. You know, they just love the team. And they'll be cheering, you know, from the beginning of the game until the end. Whereas if you go to a game in the States, if your team is playing badly, you probably, if you might even be booing. But at least you won't be cheering and yelling and going crazy. There's no organized cheerleaders in a baseball game in the States. But here there's loyal. They make, they make a song for each player. Each player has his own song that all the fans sing, and they all know the songs. Right? Can you see, see that happen in the States? It's not going to happen in the United States. You know, every team in Japan has a catchphrase, a slogan that they decide before the season starts, and the, you know, the manager announces what it is. It's usually been determined by an ad agency that that slogan's going to be, but they say the manager thought it up. 
but they have all these rituals, all these kinds of things, and it's it's a, a it's kind of a real intense blind loyalty to the team. Although you see that in the NFL, you see some of that. You see the people that are raging, you know, fans for a certain team. But I think there's a more objective look at the game in the states. You know, I, especially in baseball that I grew up with. You know, if the opposing team's player makes an unbelievable play, you know, amazingly good play, you you give them a, you know, you may even give them a standing ovation because you know you appreciate what's really good on the field. But I think in Japan here they just have a different way of approaching things, and I think there's a blind loyalty that goes beyond common sense sometimes. Do you think that blind loyalty is one of the reasons why the teams in Japan aren't willing to cooperate in regards to the merchandising in regards to their franchising, or do you think that there's another reason for that? Well, in baseball, there's a particular roadblock, which is the Yomiuri Giants. You know, the Yomiuri Giants started professional baseball in Japan, and the Yomiuri Giants controlled Japanese baseball still to this day. Uh, the owner of the Yomiuri Giants is Mr. Watanabe, Tsuneo Watanabe. He's in his 90s now, and a lot of people hope that he goes soon so that things might change. <laughs> Excuse me for saying that, but anyhow, you know, they decide, he decides who the commissioner is going to be. Besides how interleague games are going to be played. Since the Giants started baseball in this country when they brought over Babe Ruth uh, in 1936, they feel they still own it, and most of the Japanese defer to them in that way. And the, you know, the Giants games, like in the Central League, are always sold out. So the, the biggest cash cow for the teams on the road, you know, when someone comes to town, it's when the Giants come to town, the stadium is full, and they're going to make a lot of money. When the Giants leave, they're going to have fewer fans and not make as much money. And so... The Giants rule the roost, and they make the decisions on marketing. And I think that some of the owners and some teams in the, in the past have suggested that we should all cooperate. Well, the Giants said, we don't need you. We, we, we know. Really, they're cutting their own throat. They don't really realize that. And I talk about this in speeches that I do and so forth. But the Giants are a real stumbling block that, that, that they, they don't want to particularly cooperate with anyone else, and they want to rule the roost, and they, they feel that that's their entitlement. It's not good, uh, but you think that these owners of teams in the other sports do, that there are some smart people there. Uh, you'd think that realize if they cooperate that they could build a model like it's built in North Ameri American sports, but they don't do it. I don't, you know, it's a, to me actually it's a mystery in a way. I don't think it's a kind of blind loyalty. It's a, it's a blind stupidity to me. If the head of the Yamori Giants came to you and said, you know, we're losing money, what do we do? What, how can we save it so that we don't make a, that we can get back into the black and not in the red? What would you say to them? What would you advise them to do? Oh, immediately all 12 teams have got to cooperate on, on, on broadcasting. You know, I mean, the major source of, of revenue for the Olympics, for every, you know, NFL especially, and all the major sports franchises probably in the world is tele television revenue. And here it's minuscule. Like with the with the Rockton Eagles, I was you know the, the the broadcast revenue is like number ten on the on on the on the totem pole of of income sources. Very minor, very very minor. Where in the states it's number one usually. And uh, I'd say first you got to you know you've got to have you know, all twelve teams got to market themselves in one package. There's an interesting story that I use in my speeches uh, about the uh, former owner of the New York Giants football team in the NFL, uh, Mara. What was his first name? Died 90, 90 some years old. He was like with the team for 80 years. He was, his dad owned the team, the New York Giants, and then, uh, and then he took over. He was a ball boy, but then he worked with the team in high school and in college his dad died. And he and his brother took over the team. But anyhow, Wellington Mara was his name. And Wellington Mara, uh, when TV came along in the 60s for the broadcast, you know, all the New York networks wanted to broadcast the New York Giants because they're one of the original teams, one of the strong teams, and they're all in New York, so it's easy to – production costs are low and you don't have to go across the country. And also everybody wanted to broadcast the Giants, and Mara said, no, you got to broadcast that you – know, you have to put on uh, that little team in Pittsburgh called the Steelers and that little team in, of all places, Wisconsin and a place called Green Bay. You're going to have to put them on. And he said, I want you – you know, I, it's best for the league that every team be broadcast equally. And – that was an amazing boost to the NFL. Whereas in Japan, a, a, the Giants here, which is the Yomiuri Giants, Mr. Watanabe has been happy to have the Giants be on TV every day. When I came to Japan, the only team that was on TV uh, broadcast every single night nationally was the Giants. Only. And most of the teams in the Pacific League never had a national broadcast the entire year. It just doesn't work that way. 
and 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 Mr. Mr. Mara was really smart in what he recommended the league, and he did a number of things. I mean, he's the guy that really is a, is he, he created the Super Bowl. In 1970, when the American Football League came along and wanted to compete with the NFL, everybody wanted to see if they could keep players from playing in that rival league, the AFL. And so the pressure was put on coaches not to let their players go to the AFL. Pressure was put on broadcast networks not to broadcast AFL games. And Mara got up in the owners meeting and said, you know, it's a big country and people like football. Why don't we merge with them? And that's where you got the AFL and the NFL, you know, under one roof. And... Mr. Mara was a smart man. They don't have a guy that's able to lead like that here in Japan, unfortunately. So broadcasting would have to change. Licensing would have to end. All you know, The licensing revenue for all the leagues in North America is incredible because you can go to one person in New York City and talk about a license for, for all the teams if you want. In Japan, if you want to get a license, you have to go to each city, to each team, and you have to bow down and do different contracts with each team. So licensing goes no place. You got, a, you got the picture? Yeah. <laughs> You think it'll ever change? It hasn't changed in my, you know, I've been here almost 50 years, you know, and, and it hasn't, hasn't changed in all this time. I, it's a little better. When I became the general manager of the team in 2004 at one of the first general managers meetings, I said a couple things need to be changed. And one of the things I said is we need to have NPB, you know, the Japan, you know, Nippon Professional Baseball Marketing Arm. So all 12 teams should co- cooperate on marketing and TV broadcasts and so forth internationally. And uh, uh, the Giants especially didn't think that was necessary. And, you know, since the Giants didn't think it was necessary, all the Central League teams fell in line. So it didn't happen. But I said that even though after the first year when I was no longer uh, general manager but assistant to the president, those meetings I would begin to say, we need, we need an NPB marketing arm. We need an NPB. I kept saying it year after year. And about f- after five or six years, the Pacific League formed a Pacific League marketing arm. So now if you want to in Japan, you can go to the Pacific League office, which is run by a friend of mine in Tokyo, and you can do a deal with the six Pacific League teams. But the the, the Pacific League is – they're the junior league in a way because the Giants are in the in the Central League. And you know, most people want to do a deal with all 12 clubs, not six, especially if it's Pacific League. They might be more interested if it was the six in the Central League, but it's not because the Giants are there and, and prevent that from happening. You talked about you've been there for a very long time. You've had a very storied career, not just in baseball and acting and writing and so many fields in Japan. What would you say is your proudest professional achievement in your career? I think that has to be you becoming the general manager of the Rockton Eagles. That, as I said to you, that was a really big deal in this country. And as I said, I think there was like 300 cameras in the biggest auditorium at the Hyatt Regency Hotel in Tokyo, you know. Maybe three, four hundred writers, you know, and it was incredible the response and and what happened right after that. So that was a big deal, and now it's a real honor to be able to do a, a second round with the with the basketball team here in Sendai. But I would say that the Rockton Eagles uh, job was the pinnacle. What advice would you have for someone who wanted to work in the world of professional sports, either in America or Japan? Well, I mean, the first thing is they have to know the sport in in and out. They have to know it really well. And then they have to have a burning desire to, to, to be in that profession, and it's tough. Generally, uh, I think it's the same in both countries. You, you have to almost throw yourself in the doorsteps of these people again and again and again, and, and you have to first volunteer to be an intern. And a lot of people that go to a school and, and get an advanced degree in, in sports management in the States, you know, get a master's degree or whatever it is, and they think they're gonna, there are going to be a lot of jobs out there for them. They're not. There's just 100 you know, people that want every job. So it's really hard to get your foot in the door. So you really have to knock on a lot of doors. You have to, you know, pound a lot of concrete. You have to send out resume after resume. And I even tell the kids, you keep sending them every year because you don't know when a a fresh set of eyes is going to look at that resume and give you a chance and let you have an interview. But it's really tough. It's a very hard profession to get into either in the States or here. And it, it just takes amazing persistence. And you have to be knowledgeable too. I mean, when, once you're able to get in the door and meet people, if, if they, you know, think you're a fraud and you really don't understand the game, or they don't really think you really are passionate enough about it, that you, you maybe want the job because you think it's going to be profitable at some point, you have to go into that, you know, a, a sports job either in the states or here, knowing that you're not going to make diddly for quite a while. 
And only when you climb the ladder, you know, will it start paying. It's like the comedians in Japan on these shows that you're watching. You know, they, they have to be apprentices for 10, 15 years before they start to make a living wage. Similar in sports. What advice would you have for someone who wanted to work in television in Japan? Well, the first thing is really good Japanese. Really good Japanese. And I'm not talking about so-so you can get along. You know, you, 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 there's only a couple of guys that I put in the in the league, and there are only a couple of guys that have stuck around or will stick around. And not not very many. I mean, Dave Spector's the best, and he's been in the business the longest in many respects. And, well, Kent and Dave, and one of the reasons they've been around for so long is they really know their profession, and their Japanese is excellent. Uh, I think uh, in, in another in a newer generation now is Puck Kuhn. You know, I don't like his. Excuse me for saying this. I don't particularly like his style. Of the way he presents himself, but his Japanese is really good. He's a smart guy, and he he, he can have a long long career in in, you know, in this profession. Most of the people I don't think are willing in, uh, to spend the time necessary to really get that good. So I think the first thing you got to have the Japanese, and another thing is got to be persistent too. And then you, it, luck helps a lot too. You know, I mean, persistent, persistent, persistent. But at some point, you're going to meet the right people. You know, and as I'm a people person, basically, and, you know, people introduce me to someone else, who introduce me to someone else, introduce me to someone else, and it built there. You know, I've been asked by young people sometimes, sometimes, how do I get a job like yours? And I said, well, you have a couple of hours, we'll sit down here and talk about my pathway. It's not a, you know, a simple path that I've led. And a lot of it's had to do with the people that I knew and the people that were kind to me and, and, and uh, made introductions or, or opened the doors for me. So they have to have the language, be really persistent, and a little bit of luck will help, too. Any of the people that helped you out become that you'd like to give tribute to? They just any names you'd like to throw out of people that you feel were really helpful for you in your career? That's a good question. At each each turn, there was somebody. When I was on NHK right out of college, you know, uh, Anse Yokota from Fuji TV called me and asked me if I wanted to be, you know, on uh, Otogo Atsurayo. And I didn't know Anse. Never met him before. He just liked me, what he saw on TV, and got together, and he was, you know, a benefactor and, and, and Pierre gets so, you know, the Frenchman would happen to be in, and he was in a, a ramen shop or something eating ramen when he saw me on that NHK show. And then he went through NHK to get to me. But that was only one part of my life. That was a nice step and an interesting thing to do. But I just had a series of people like that. I haven't had like one mentor that's mentored me for years and years and years and years. Somebody that I sound things off a lot is Dave. Dave and I have supported each other a lot, but I'm the sports guy, not Dave. The interesting thing is about you two, of the guys you've had on. Oh, you haven't had Dave on. You've had Kent and and uh, Chuck and Chuck. Chuck. But the interesting thing is, I uh, think about this. I remember that when doing an NFL game here, I was the main broadcaster, the commentator in the booth. But they got Dave to be on one sideline to be a sideline reporter, and Chuck to be on the other line to be this sideline reporter from the other side and both the guys called me within about a 24 hour period to ask me what they should say <laughs> they didn't know how to analyze a football team for, for any reason you know dave is just not athletic at all if you see any of the funny things he's been on some uh like those celebrity softball teams mm -hmm. he's horrible god is he horrible he's i love him he's like a brother to me but he's not an athlete and and chuck uh, Chuck's really the interesting thing is Chuck uh, can't play any ball games, but what Chuck can do is judo, and he was really good at judo, and then he was good at weightlifting. So, so Chuck can't play ball games. So Chuck doesn't know anything. You look, I think initially sometimes Chuck would talk to me because he, since he looked like a an athlete, people assumed I think that he knew all sports, and really Chuck goes only into two sports. So. Chuck and Dave were very grateful to me that I broke down everything that they needed to know about both teams and, you know, the key things that they could say about those teams and bring up during the course of the broadcast. I know you've heard me say it before on the other ones, but I'm going to say it again because it's the limited <laughs> knowledge of it. Oh, Sugashi, uh, Tokoro, o Jikan, o Saite, Itaraki, Arigato gozaimasu. And feel free to make fun of that later. Super Very good. Excellent. Thank you. Helps when you have it written down. <laughs>